having this unusual weight to my words of saying, God, I trust you, and knowing that there's a fear in that. Like, what, what am I inviting in here? Um, yeah. Not knowing what is going to come, what hardships may lie ahead of me, or, or joys, or trials. Um, but in pondering those questions in the last few services, just that really hit me. Just, wow. I, I remember as a teenager, like, times where I have said, God, please come. Like, I invite you into the rest of my life. Mm. Yeah. So November 12th, 2017. And let me, well, let me just pause actually for a moment because I want to show you some, one of the things that was, has been a real gift uh, of Tyler's that God has given him that he has found ways to express is wildlife photography, nature photography. That this was part of your life beforehand, very much so, and will be again, of going out deep into the woods, all over the country, taking photos. Is that right? Crazy wild places, yeah. all hours of the day or night. That's great. Yeah. So we're going to be sharing some photos as we talk um, from Tyler's recovery, but also interspersed with those will just be some photos that he has taken. All of, all of these you'll see are his own artwork. So going back, November 12th, 2017, what happened on that day? Um, we were at home celebrating my son's birthday. Um, I just finished up, finished setting up a zip line and all of us were having a joyous time playing with that, of course. And then um, all of us decided to go off on different trails in the woods and uh, we decided to pass by this one particular trail I went near my tree stand that I hadn't finished setting up yet. Um, I was with Michelle and Sylvia and Elia and I said, okay, just, just go on up ahead. I just want five more minutes just to finish setting this up. I've been itching, dying to do it. Um, she said, no, we'll wait. We'll watch. Um, it turned out to be a great thing. But um, I get it all up. I'm sitting in it. I'm telling them. I'm boring them with all the details of how great this new spot is I picked out right. um, for archery. And as I go to step out... My left foot goes on the ladder and slips right off. I go to reach a branch. The branch breaks, and I'm free-falling backwards about 25 feet. Um, where I landed on a jagged rock, right at my, the center of my back. Um, burst fracture of my T12 vertebrae, severe spinal cord injury, um, severe bruising and swelling, um, and a broken wrist, which I didn't even realize at the time. It was because of the pain in my back. Um, right away, Michelle and Sylvia, and I mean, Sylvia was sleeping. Michelle and Elia came rushing over um, to support me. And in those moments while we were trying to call the paramedics and get them out in the woods, the rest of the family came closer. Um, that was when I had to process, how am I going to tell Michelle? Like, it's numb from here down. It's completely... Uh, yeah, nothing. And trying to a process how I was going to share that with her. Mm. Um. So they, uh, the paramedics eventually come and find you in the woods. The, the kids are helping, helping you, them sort out where you are and trying to rally back and forth and get you there. And they medevac you to Yale New Haven yep. Hospital. Is that right? Yeah, I think I made it there in 40 minutes, which was... Just unbelievable because I was in the middle of nowhere out in the woods. Yeah, that's ATV, incredible. ATV, then medevac, and Yale New Haven. So you, uh, after the first initial examinations and MRI, what were the doctors telling you at that point? Um, there was a moment, I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was just Michelle, uh, the surgeon, and myself. And I said, please give it to me straight. I didn't know exactly what the answer was going to be, but I knew it was a very good chance that it was going to be bad. Um, so he said, very calmly and quietly, I give you a 50-50 chance that you're going to walk again. If you do, it might be two years. Um, we shared some tears together, but I was alive. So, mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, you come out of 
you, they rush you into surgery. You come out of surgery, and what is going on with you? There must be so many things going through your mind, but what's going on for you spiritually at that time? What, what was your sense of where God was at in that um, moment? For me, that's the, ultimately the craziest part about the whole story is as soon as I hit, like moments after I hit the ground, I was flooded with unbelievable grace and spirit. I mean, so much so that I, the whole way out of the woods, I was singing hymns, singing songs that I haven't sung for months or whatever, just, you know, the mm-hmm. usuals. Uh, it is well with my soul or mm-hmm. amazing grace. Just, mm-hmm. And just, and praying for my family. That was, um, I think when the chaplain snuck my family in before surgery, you know, there was just complete silence. They didn't. I don't feel like they knew what to say or what to pray, but the Spirit was so upon me. It didn't make sense, but it was just, I started praying for them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was the crazy. And then that continued. Amazing. For months. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, yeah, you've expressed many times, I think, your sense of like, uh, that there was just something so immediate about God's presence or something so real about it. In those, yeah. those few months afterwards. So you uh, were transferred over to like a rehab hospital for a couple months. Mm-hmm. For those of us who have never had to endure rehab, what is that like? Hmm. I don't know what it is like without nerve pain. <laughs> um, <laughs> nerve yeah. pain changes everything. Mm. Um, that was by far the worst of the whole experience was learning how to eventually get up, just learn how to sit on the edge of the bed. Um, I couldn't even be transferred to the wheelchair for the first week and a half. Um, Like going over a threshold of a doorway in the wheelchair eventually, I mean, once I got in the wheelchair, was it would bring tears to my eyes every time. Mm. Um, Or somebody somebody just bumped the bed slightly, it would take my breath away. so getting to the therapy, it took about, I think, two weeks before mm-hmm. I could start doing therapy. And I finally made the decision that I was in just as much pain doing therapy or not. And you're going to get better at doing therapy, or you can sit here and not. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a tough choice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, difficult, that's a difficult road for anybody. And you were in the midst of, of this experience that you, 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 you said earlier, sort of this, it was crazy how... Uh, close you felt to God. I've heard you talk even before about a a kind of irrational optimism uh, Mm -hmm. that you were feeling at the time. Were there moments when you were really tempted to feel otherwise? It's it's, as weird as it is. I I kept looking for that. I kept looking for those moments, but actually I can't recall a moment. I mean, there were moments that were extremely difficult. Um, but I always knew that I was going to get through it, and I had the support I needed, um, both spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Um, Tell me a little bit more about during that time, uh, what, both in terms of your family and in terms of maybe other friends and people in your community, what did community come to mean to you during that time? Um, pivotal, for sure. <laughs> mm. um, I think there are three major aspects, um, and without one of them, it would be a a different story today, I think. Community being one of those, family, friends, church. um, Doctors, therapists, nurses would be like another one, Mm -hmm. and then obviously Jesus Christ being the most important one, of course. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, The three of those things um, brought me here today. So now you have been sort of uh, in these last six months or so kind of transitioning back to civilian life, let's mm-hmm. call it, just your regular life. What has, that, what has that been like for you to now think about the future again? It's uh, liberating in a way. It's kind of um, it's this weird opportunity that I have to reimagine some of the dreams that God had in my life before mm. before I got ingrained in doing nine to five construction work 
Um, and I had wanted to pursue something different. I mean, mm -hmm. The reason I'm in Connecticut in the first place was to do missions work and nonprofit work. Mm -hmm. um, just certain, certain things got in the way of that. And it's, it's weird to be in this position where I actually have that freedom to reimagine what are God's dreams over me now. Yeah, I mean, as much as we're here today to talk about some seeds that God has planted that have now brought fruit in your life, there, there are still seeds being planted for a whole new future now. And that's pretty, it's been amazing. It's been amazing yeah. to watch you figure that out. You, you might not be able to see this, I'm, uh, but behind you on the screen, I'm showing a picture from the hike uh, just a couple weeks ago. Oh, Tell us what this... <laughs> Tell us about this picture. Um, I guess I'll back up to, I think, and Michelle would be witness or whoever else was there, but I, I remember saying days after when I could only move my right toe that I was going to hike a mountain again. Um, within a year. <laughs> mm. That was just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> what has been the the significance of this anniversary for you? Um, I think the most significant thing is that this year has been kind of a year of recovery. And mm -hmm. I could easily say, well, I'm going to coast. I'm going to coast from here. Mm -hmm. But the one-year mark shows to me that I'm ready to move forward and move yeah. into something else. And yeah. I'm not willing to coast. That's great. This, uh, and I would commend you, this, this is even just a real step of faith today to come and share this, I think, that you had, uh, you've mentioned before that you, you had told God within one year you wanted to stand up in front of ECV and tell this story, talk about this a little bit. Yeah, I think in the first month or so, um, it's easy to say when you're in a hospital bed and you can't actually make it to church, but... <laughs> I was like, there was so much spirit and so much outpouring of God's love hitting me every day and every moment. Mm. I was like, there's no way I can keep this contained to myself. Yeah. Um, and I made a commitment to speak in church in some capacity within a year. And I'm just barely, <laughs> you, you left barely it to five making minute. that in there. We have until midnight. Uh, <laughs> But this is, thank you so much for yeah. taking that step. This is uh, also a part of the journey, I think, that God has had you on of, in terms of thinking about the future is now what, what do you make of this experience and how do, how do you use it uh, in some way to bless and care for other people? I'm going to show them uh, another picture that you, you might not see of, of the stones that you set oh, yeah. uh, right under the tree where you fell. What's in this, what's this picture of this little monument here I don't even have to look at it I know exactly <laughs> I know it well um, when I think of or look at that tree or go visit it I don't I'm not angry I'm, I don't feel the pain I don't think any negative thoughts I think it's sacred holy ground mm. I'm, just, I'm thankful that it took place and that's really it just doesn't make sense <laughs> Yeah, but I wouldn't take it back in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. All the months of nerve pain that I still deal with on a daily basis, mm -hmm. um, I've traded that all in for something that is um, that doesn't have a measurable value to it. Amen. So, tell us a little bit more about what what would you say you have learned. Uh, in this last year? What are the, th some of the things that God has brought out of you in new ways? Um, a reminder to keep trusting. Mm. Um, I think it's... One, and one, okay, one thing does come to mind that... Um, I remember sitting outside the therapy room, maybe on a weekend, just sipping coffee and, and just... Every day I would go in there, I would see other people that are struggling. I don't mm. have a monopoly on pain. That is very mm. clear when you're at a hospital at Gaylord. Mm. And that built a new compassion in me that I didn't know before. And 
sitting there looking out at the snow-covered Japanese garden. <laughs> um, I close my eyes and I see, I'm, I take a step forward, it's, it's foggy. It's just completely, I'm completely shrouded in fog. And I'm watching as the fog lifts and it's like the Grand Canyon. And that Grand Canyon represented God's love and compassion. And mine is six inches. That was my step. Mm. And just seeing this is God's compassion. Mm. And knowing that that is available to discover. Yeah. One of the greatest things I've learned in that. That's, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what would you say that it, you, you had talked about how God had kind of planted these seeds of learning how to trust and uh, an emphasis on uh, that God is trustworthy in, even in your early life before the accident. So what does it mean for you now today to trust God? Um, with this new experience, I mean, I've had multiple different um, painful experiences, uh, certain ones that I've had to endure for years on the same topic. Um, but I think with this one, it brings such a clarity. I mean, I remember chuckling to myself while I was at the hospital, just realizing that nothing can shake the foundation of Christ in me. Mm. I never doubted it before, but with such clarity, it's like, I'm, I'm not afraid of anything that could come. Mm. And that this experience galvanized what I've already been conditioned to endure through the different challenges of my life. Mm. What, would you, what would you say to someone who is here today who is also going through a time of suffering in their life, whether that's emotional, psychological, physical, um, I mean, I keep saying the word trust, but mm. trust and hope. Mm. I think there, there's such a power in the ability to hope. And um, whether it's during times of pain or whether it's during times of joy, all those, giving those to God and letting God use those moments. I mean, that was another image that came to me was... Um, Just realizing as, I mean, I had this picture of falling through the air again. I was having flashbacks of that moment and feeling God rushing in like a wind saying, I can use that before I even hit the ground. Hmm. So I would say just trust God. Give that to him. Give him your all. Give, give the good. Give the bad. Give the pain. Hmm. He can use it. Hmm. I'm- What would you, as we join together with you, maybe in, in worshiping, even in celebrating how far you've come in a year, what, what is it that you really want to celebrate? Um, the more likely response would probably be celebrate that I'm walking again, or, um, you know, I can watch Sylvia, I can pick her up, I can walk around with her, I can go on hikes, I can climb mountains again. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, that's not, that, that's a wonderful bonus. That's not what I'm here celebrating. And that's, what I'm celebrating is the impact that God has had on my life mm. every step of the way. Mm. It's prepared me for whatever can come. Mm. Amen. You, um, I don't know, I, I might be catching you off guard here, so it's totally fine. But okay. if you, um, you had written something down uh, a couple days before the accident, and you had mentioned at times that you might want to share that with us. Would you like to share it with us? I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you, uh, if I need to step in <laughs> at some point and take up the reading, that's so totally little, fine. I can give a little backstory. Um, yeah, please. Without going into too much detail. Please. But, um, but yeah, the, the years of a particular struggle. Um, I was deeply in the thick of that and probably the darkest moments of that, the days before my accident. But some imagery, again, I'm not somebody that gets a lot of images, but (laughs) 
I was um, feeling extreme darkness around me, and, and words just came to me like a flood. Um, and I wrote this letter um, days before my accident, and I think it had such a such a powerful impact on ushering in the, the spiritual posture that I was in mm. uh, going into the days that were to come. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'd be happy to share it if I can get through it. <laughs> we would love to hear it. I made it's not perfect, but I uh, I tried not to alter it too much from what its original content was. Patience, perseverance, waiting. Every letter of those words means much more when you reflect on years of a particular struggle or a time in your life when there was a sustained hardship. While through it, hoping and dreaming against the odds was all you could cling to. Now, we have all heard phrases like, I would walk through hot coals for blank or climb to the moon and back for blank. But at times like this, I wish the solution was that easy. Then my pain and work would be complete. And with time, the burns from coals underfoot would heal and the blisters of my hands would eventually bear new skin to keep climbing. Recently, I have been on some of the steepest slopes in my ascent to secure a better, more God-filled life for myself, my family, and my community. And it's been far from easy. For years, I have had tired-to-your bones and eyes struggle around one particular pain-filled hardship or another, all while remaining as hopeful, faithful, and expectant as I can be for more of Christ in us. It's now that I am realizing even more clearly than ever before Those very struggles and pains have ushered in some of the most powerful, most beautiful encounters with our Savior. So I wouldn't ever trade them back. One such encounter opened itself to me just days before my accident, during some moments when darkness unleashed a fury against me and everything I stood for. By God's grace, the darkness came to a sad crawl before it because of this effect. Sorry, because of this fact. You cannot stop the light. I don't receive many spiritual pictures, but that day in the midst of the oppression and lies, I received this image. In some sort of spherical posture to the darkness on all sides, I physically felt I was shrinking, but not in a negative way. As the image continued, I saw a small light like the light of a star continue to get smaller, compressed, denser, all layers pressed deeper down to the core, refined, until all it had left was more light, more energy, and more power than ever before, less of me and more of him. Then soon after and at just the right time, it exploded in a supernova. Not because this light couldn't take it anymore, but because the darkness had nothing left to dish out and no more lies to attempt the fruitless constraint. The more this seemingly vast and bloated darkness pressed in all around, the more it became its own undoing. Since its supposed containment was now this light's catalyst, the small light could now beam out from within with the might of a thousand suns in all directions with all purpose. This picture and experience bears repeated witness to me of a story far bigger than my own with its small, temporary pains. God is vastly bigger than my story, and I believe this is an image for and about the wrestling of our hearts and minds to attain a clear and infectious hope. May these words encourage you for whatever you face in your own struggles and stress. Be filled with the light. No matter the cost, no matter the waiting, no matter the hurt, no matter how small, put down, or compressed you feel, know that the light matters, and the light will reign as the axiom. Yours truly, a husband, a father, a friend, 
and a fellow bearer of an incendiary hope. John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. Amen. I made Amen. It. <laughs> I made it Amen. Amen. I would love to invite you, if you are an elder, uh, a leader, someone who has loved and cared for Tyler uh, here, we would love to invite you forward. I'm, I'm going to pray for him, but I would love to have your presence here along with us. We have laid hands and prayed for Tyler, laid hands on Tyler and prayed for him many times before, but this time we are not doing it for healing. We are doing it as an act of thanksgiving that we all together are coming to share in this offering to God. Lord Jesus, this group of people represents just a sample of those many who have loved and cared for Tyler, who have been so deeply affected by his story and what you have done in this last year. Lord, each one of them has felt a wound in their own life. And here we are, Lord. We want to thank you, and we want to praise you, Lord. We thank you not only for what you have done in Tyler's physical body, but what you have done in his spirit and soul. That now more than ever before, he can say, I have built my house upon the rock. This is my firm foundation. We praise you, God. We love you, Lord, because you have loved us. And your expression of love in this man's life has been an expression of love to us as well. And because he is one of us, he belongs to us. This is our celebration alongside of him. He is not some man who just comes to talk to us like a visiting speaker. He is one of us. He is part of this family. And so, Lord, it is this family that you have blessed. And we want to thank you. Receive, holy God, our worship and our prayers and our praise to you as a fragrant offering. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't doubt that, that the Spirit is speaking to many of you in many different ways. Uh, through what Tyler has shared to each of you in your particular circumstances. So I just want to share for just a couple minutes of what I have had the privilege of hearing through Tyler's story uh, over this last year. I have had the, the, the benefit of having heard this story several times now from beginning to end, and so I get a little bit more time to process these things. Some of you are right in the middle of it. But if this can be any help to you, let me just share a few things. When I hear Tyler's story, the first thing that pops into my mind is this very well-known passage from Philippians chapter 4. I have learned to be content with whatever I have, Paul writes. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty, plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now this last verse, Philippians 4.13, perhaps one of the the most often quoted verses completely out of context that you will find in the entire Bible. I used to work out at a YMCA where in the weight room they had this written on the wall. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And I don't think Paul was talking about like the bench press, but... But I mean, one day I might get to heaven, and if Paul turns out to be just like yoked, like this massive dude, I'm going to be like, well, sorry. I guess I should have read the Bible a lot more literally than I did, I guess. 
But there is this, this kind of danger, even in this passage, which I, which I love and affirm. There is this danger that in this weird way, these words become distorted out of context. There is this danger that we read Paul as saying that he is happy all the time. And that we should be happy because we can do anything through Christ. And so if we are not happy or at least content, then that is kind of like a personal failure. So if you are someone who is suffering and what you hear this scripture saying is that you ought to be happier, let me suggest that that is the enemy trying to get in and twist some things around. If what you hear is that your feelings are insignificant, unimportant, should just generally be ignored— then that, I think, is also a distortion. And if you hear that it's wrong to ask God to change things, change things dramatically in your life, because you should just learn to be content, then I think that's a distortion as well. Because to be more specific about Paul, he has a, he has a very specific context here. The Philippians, the church in Philippi, has been sending him gifts, and they sent him a gift, and he's writing back to say how grateful he is for their particular support, but he's also trying to kind of say to them, it would be fine even if you hadn't sent gifts to me. God would still have taken care of me. And so I don't hear Paul or Tyler, for that matter, saying that they are happy all the time. I do hear them saying that I am learning all of the different ways that in all circumstances Christ gives me strength. Sometimes that strength is even to walk again. Even when people doubted that it would ever be possible. And because of that, what God has done in Tyler and in Paul, that is something to celebrate. We want to worship God. Celebration is actually not an emotion. It's something we associate with emotions, but it is not an emotion. It's an activity. It may arise out of emotion, but it does not depend on emotion. Celebration is just the same thing as worship or faith or love or trust. It is something we decide to do. It is a choice that we make. And so as I've been thinking about it, I've, I've wondered if maybe a better expression of Tyler's experience is in this, this passage from Hebrews chapter 13, where the author of Hebrews was writing to a particular Christian community that was experiencing an enormous amount of suffering and persecution. But the author says to them, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus also suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. So then let us then go to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. For here... We have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. At, at moments in all of our lives, we will experience a little something of what Tyler has experienced. To know a a physical or emotional or psychological or spiritual pain that Jesus has already known. And it forces us out of, our, out of our city in the language of Hebrews, out of our home, out of this place that we have depended on, where we feel most comfortable, and out into a place where we can only depend on God. And it is possible then from there to offer a sacrifice of praise what is that? I mean, right from the start, it sounds like a contradiction. Sacrifice? Bad. Praise? Good. So what, what are we talking about here? What do these two things have to do with one another? We hope and even pray sometimes that God will give us good reasons to praise him. And we fear sacrifice. So what is a sacrifice of praise? But these, these feelings that we have, these feelings of this hope, this fear, along with many other feelings, it's, it's easy to say that there are only two things that we could possibly do with them. That we could either ignore them and just try to pretend that they don't exist, all these feelings that we have, or else we can come, become defined by them. We can obsess over them. We polish them. We pick at them. We dig through them. We become defensive if anyone questions these feelings. That we make them into these little idols. 
But what I hear in Tyler's story is that if we really go deeper into what God is doing in us, there is never only one thing happening in our experience, but many things, sometimes many overlapping thoughts and feelings all happening in us at the same time. And for those of us who have decided to follow Jesus and have received the Holy Spirit, there is at least always one little layer, no matter how thin, this, this one little voice, no matter how soft, that speaks of a possibility in us, that speaks of excitement at what God has done and will do in us, of an eagerness that God will be the one who gets to have the last word on our lives. And so even in the midst of sadness and pain, there can also be a deeper joy. Those things are not mutually exclusive. We have room in us for both of them. And where we are experiencing joy and celebrating, there is still this awareness that we are not quite there yet in this city that has been promised to us, that all is not quite right in the world yet. Those things are not mutually exclusive. We have room inside of us for both thoughts, even at the same time. But the sacrifice of praise is to choose again and again to attend to that part inside of us that speaks of joy. To, to practice what Christians have often called a discipline of celebration. And when we choose to do that, we're, we're not being naive. We're not neglecting the way we really feel. We are simply acknowledging that we feel many things. Sometimes in the same breath. And it is possible in turning our attention to the worship of God to see that there is a real joy that remains in us in difficult times. A joy that is truly me. That is even the real me. A real honest expression of having been loved by God and wanting to love God. And so you can hear in Tyler's story his decision, for instance, in those moments when his family comes into the hospital room and doesn't know what to say, and he chooses to pray for them, to give praise and thanks to God. Is that dishonest in that moment? That he should be the one praising? Does that make this celebration inauthentic? No. It makes this celebration into a sacrifice of praise. A praise to God that is also an acknowledgement that there is pain, even in this room. And I even, even praising in order to love these people that are in pain. So there is no obligation in, in following Jesus, in the life of following Jesus, that we, that we would feel a certain sort of way. But there is a reminder that to follow Jesus means choosing over and over and over to return to the praise, worship, and celebration of God. We return again and again to the reminder that God is good, and God has got this. And in that freedom, in that discovery that you are not entirely bounded by your circumstances, there is a certain joy. Your feelings do matter. God has deeply invested in your pain, and he has done so because he is even more deeply invested in your joy. And the question for all of us will always be, what are we invested in? When we talk about God planting seeds in our life, we can be tempted to see our faith during times of difficulty as something like kind of a means to an end, steps that I need to take. I am being faithful now in this difficult time so that God will bring me to some other nicer less difficult time. And we miss sometimes that the faith God has been growing in us is the destination. Our choice to celebrate is also the thing to celebrate. That may not have been what we set out to do, but we might have had very different hopes than that, and that's perfectly fine. That's quite normal. But strangely, we often find that the sacrifice of praise is not something we do to achieve some other thing. The sacrifice of praise is the treasure that we've been seeking. Even if we didn't know it, this thing, to become people who know God as trustworthy, who know God in such a way that trusting God is its own kind of joy, 
To know the living, loving God in that way, with that kind of depth, that will turn your life upside down. So when I hear in Tyler's story is him learning how to praise and worship God even before it seemed like there was anything to celebrate. What I hear in Tyler's story is a decision to acknowledge and pay attention to the possibility of joy even when he could not walk and might never walk again. And yet, Tyler can walk. It's amazing. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, God. Thank you. We have come together as this community to celebrate this. But we are, in celebrating, we are not just celebrating that Tyler can walk. We are here to celebrate the whole story, the whole thing, the whole of who God has made Tyler. We are here to celebrate the whole of what God has done from the very beginning in Tyler's life. Everything that happened to prepare Tyler to endure this particular thing. We are coming to this sensitive place and building memorial stones there. Going back to this place of pain and saying, thank you, God. We can't believe we're saying it, but thank you. Thank you that we have this story. Thank you that we have seen your hand of goodness in Tyler's life. This is a story that is not only has been unfolding over this last year. It will continue to unfold in Tyler's life. And even this, even this willingness to give a testimony, this is part of his own offering to God. This is, it is God who is the audience here today for Tyler's words. It is God that Tyler decided that he wanted to stand up and share these things in front of. And so we want to say, God is faithful. We praise you, Jesus. And we are going to praise Jesus now. So I want to invite the worship team forward. And as I do, I, I just want to remind you of this, this story that, that Tina shared with us last week about this, this powerful testimony to her that it was seeing a group of women in Uganda who had suffered very deeply still choosing to dance. Today, it, it may be natural for some of us seeing Tyler here to just want to jump up and shout, Yes, Lord, you've done it. This is incredible. And for others, it may not be that natural in this particular moment. But there is nevertheless this invitation to come and say through tears, Yes, Lord, you are good. You are the Lord of the universe. You are the one we love. The seeds you have planted in us are, are becoming trees. And we can see them growing. We can still celebrate, even if we have tears in our eyes. And those of us who are mourning can still choose to celebrate alongside of Tyler. And so we choose to sing this afternoon. We choose to dance. We choose to shout. We choose to clap. We choose to laugh. We choose to come up and give Tyler and Michelle a huge hug. We choose to turn this into a celebration. We choose to celebrate the God who loves Tyler so dearly, who has loved us so dearly. The whole of, of the mystery of this sacrifice of praise, the whole of it is expressed here, actually, when we take communion together. Here, not in words, but in these elements, we find the whole thing. The sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice we make in following Jesus, the praise in heaven that is God's grace over us, the praise that we make in response to God. So if you are a follower of Christ, or if you would like to become one today, we invite you to come forward. Join us in this sacrifice of praise. Join us as we celebrate together. I'm going to invite the communion servers forward and let me just pray for us as we do. Lord Jesus, you have loved us you have done amazing things in our lives and we 
want to give that glory properly back to you. And so, Lord, as we come forward, receive, as we receive from you this gift, we just pray that you would receive our obedience as a gift to you as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name.